and gentlemen, Curtis Blackwell here with Soft Video Productions doing behind the scenes. And with me today is a legend, Hydroplane. A myth. A no, myth. a myth. <laughs> Mr. Pat O'Day. Hi, Pat. How are you doing? Great. Great. Uh, Curtis, nice to be back on your show again. And, uh, of course, it's very nice to be here on the shores of Lake Washington. It's uh, the 1st of August. And uh, all of Seattle is going to congregate around these hallowed shores and celebrate summer and celebrate the uh, enormous economic and uh, industrial and technical strength of Seattle and celebrate rooster tails. <laughs> Hydroplane. Hydroplane. Yeah. Hydroplane. Yeah. Uh, this is a, uh, actually, uh, there's the Rose Bowl, associated with the Rose Festival in Minneapolis. There's, uh, you know, the Winter Festival in Minneapolis, St. Paul, there are ice sculptures. And then there's Seattle, the Seafair. The Seafair just couldn't be complete without the, the real finality, the final of the event, which is that marriage between the city and the water in the form of throwing rooster tails. <laughs> Up in the air. had everybody screaming and yelling and uh, throwing down a few cold ones and having a great time. 50 years, see here. 49 for high uh, 48, actually. 49 next year because uh, it was 49 years ago that Ted Jones built this plywood and mahogany uh, boat. Had the concept that the boat could ride on three points, the two sponsons and the prop. And if he did that, he'd totally break the boat loose in the water. The boat would more fly, using the water for reference, as opposed to plowing through the waters as the uh, unlimited racing boats did at that time. So he built this boat here in Seattle. It was sponsored and driven by Stan Sayers, a little Chrysler dealer who had his dealership down on the Warren. And uh, they went back to Detroit quickly became the laughing stock of the Motor City because uh, the boat looked wrong. I mean, uh, any respectable hydroplane was wrong. One or two engines and was heavy. And here was this funny, uh, uh, rather short, rather squat looking thing. And they laughed until it went out onto the Detroit River, whereupon on one weekend it set every new world record. I mean, I mean it broke the old records by 20 miles an hour. Of course, won the Gold Cup, came here, and it was in 1951 that we had our first race here. Of course, it was a little different then. The pits were down in Mount Baker, about a quarter of a mile, half a mile south of here. The uh, start finish line was in this general vicinity on a barge that was out there. Right? And the race course was three miles along, around. It went all the way down to Seward Park practically, and then up toward the floating bridge. And uh, you see, Seattle had nothing major with really it that time. I mean, the Huskies only went to the Rose Bowl. I mentioned the Rose Bowl about once in about every 50 years. I would know. Uh, minor league baseball, and that was it. And of course, Detroit had the Pistons and the Lions. And they'd had the Gold Cup. And, uh, and uh, suddenly, we had a major league game. We would draw a half million people. Of yeah, course, they were free. Right. Big factor. Uh, some people had said Seafair was losing in popularity <laughs> when, uh, they, when the crowds diminished to only maybe 150,000 paid admission. And that was the key, paid admission. You see, ice cream sales would triple if it was free, too. You know, I mean, anything right. that's free draws more That's people. right. Sure <laughs> but uh, no, Seafair finally answer. had to, as every race had to, charge admission because of the high cost of running the and the high cost of the boats and everything. So anyway, here we South turn. Bill Muncy loses a rudder and sticks his Miss Thriftway into the side of a Coast Guard boat in 1959. 58? 1958. 58. Yeah. By the way, not the, to correct you, it's 1958. Listen, help me out. <laughs> when you get older, it all becomes just a big jumble. You know, Curtis, you just can't figure the damn thing out. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Who knows what year it was, for God's sake. A 31, couple of years ago. <laughs> 31, 58, 72 hike. Um, but uh, that, that was an interesting thing. Muncie, just before he hit the Coast Guard boat, he bailed out. 
it hits the Coast Guard boat, completely enters the side of it. The hydroplane is buried in the side of the Coast Guard cutter, hit it at about 140 miles an hour. Wow. Uh, and just as the two are sinking beneath the water, one of the Coast Guardsmen who had been asleep in his bunk down below decks crawls out through the hole created <laughs> by the thriftway just as it went down. Oh, wow. I mean, we're talking high drama there. But uh, uh, this race course out here, uh, seen the spectacular, seen the Winston uh, do a complete somersault out there, the Winston Eagle. Saw just uh, four years ago, Miss Elam, an experimental boat, uh, climb like 100 feet into the air and yes. come down. We have that and, on tape. Oh, you do? Yes, I, that, that was, that on this tape here that was one of those extraordinary events. Uh, and, and it's a shame to talk about the accidents as extraordinary events, because the matter of fact is, the extraordinary thing is what this city has. And that is a log boom filled with billions of dollars of fabulous yachts. People along the shore here in the final spasms of seafare each year, having a wonderful time. Oh, yeah. uh, hydroplaning is truly a Seattle sport. Most of the boats are based here. The drivers are from places like Mike Hansen's Federal Way, Nate Brown is Issaquah, Dave Vilwalk, Port Orchard, and Auburn now, Chip Hansen. Miles, miles an hour, hour for the wow. lap. Wow. So uh, the sport, can, the boats continue to go faster. The crowds continue to pack the shores around the country where the races are held. Some people think that hydroplaning over its 50 years, you know, they look and they think it should go major league, play the big cities. The problem is the big cities don't have this. Lake Washington. Lake Washington. And they the don't Bay have Lake. a Columbia River like Pasco. It takes a body of water and it generally takes some municipally owned land along the shore to stage a race like this. So there's some cities where it just doesn't make any sense. And as a result, the sport will never get a foothold in those towns. But where the sport has gained that foothold, well, you look at Detroit, mm -hmm. crowd this year bigger than ever. Uh, you look at Seattle, you look at Pasco, San Diego, Honolulu, Madison, and uh, and Evansville, and now Newport, Rhode or Newport, uh, Virginia, and uh, so the sport is alive. It is growing. It is strong. Seafair continues to grow. Is so alive and is so strong. And uh, well, aren't we lucky to be a part of it? Yes, we are. Tell you what, Curtis. Uh, if you want kind of a little more history, uh, I think the next place we ought to go with this little interview is down to the pits. That's a good idea. Let's stroll down there with our cameras and and uh, see what memories that evokes. Oh, it'll bring back a lot of memories. <laughs> so we're going to, ladies and gentlemen, with Paddle Day, we're going to head on down to the hydroplane pits and talk more history with a legend here, Paddle Day. Be a very low level today if it goes. It's going to be nice. I wonder if they can run the blues on instruments. Come back before I'm sorry. Probably can. No one in there. Is this the Dolly? Is this Don on the tower? This is Don. Okay, Don, the Dolly from Cairo. That bay up there, he's got some music and everything. Wonderful. Good footage up there. Good job uh, up here. Last time I was up there was oh, eight years ago. Went up there and saw the Eagle Point. Fantastic. First time I ever went up there was 71. There was a, a big island that was out there. So if you were on the north south side of the point, you were the south turn.
by the crane right over here. The boat was about 20 feet in the air, ready to go out on the course. It was lifted up on the crane. And usually there's people around underneath it. By some happenstance, no one was there. As they dropped the boat the full 20 feet and it crashed back onto the finger pier. It was shooting up in the air and that was the grand introduction. No damage done because it was just a, oh, what do they call it? A fuel fire, you know, inside the engine. But anyway, uh, the flames went way up in the air and the fire trucks turned their sirens on and, and uh, everybody thought the world had come to an end, of course. But uh, in the pits, I can't help be, but think of names in the pits. I think of the late Steve Woomer. Well, we're going to be walking on that's, down. That's right. Let's walk on, let's walk on that way. I've got a lot of personal memories here, too, but we're here to talk. Into the pits on the shore side. This is a, an area where traditionally the uh, were housed. You see, Bernie Little always had his spot. Bill Munson spot over there on the other side. Uh, Steve Woomer was up at the end. We'll get up there in a moment. Which we can do, in spite of the low ceilings we have. From your left, once again, Mr. Wayne Hanley in the Oracle Turbo Raven. Always good to have you here, my man. Thank nice you very to much. You. Take care of yourself. Thank you very much. All right. Here's your Ladies coffee and back. gentlemen, this is like the big round of applause. All the way up here from Greenfield, California, Mr. This Wayne Hanley. I told the guy to be oh. here at 1025 and ask me for an offer. <laughs> okay. All stage. All stage. Okay. As always.